All right, good morning. Welcome back. Last week, huh? All right, so we are, uh, so this week the plan is to just wrap up the last, last topic actually uh, today and then we'll leave the last two classes just to do sort of a review and also just to give you a brief overview of what we have done in the entire course. But what I'll also do is I'll start a sort of a gradient, oh, sorry, a piazza thread where you can post what topic or a particular gradient problem that you would like to uh, look at, okay? Uh, and of course, the TAs are going to be here whole week, so if you have questions, you can go there. For the undergraduate, of course, the recitations uh, are there this week, and they will primarily be doing the finals review, right? So please make use of that as well. Uh, next week, we won't have any uh, office hours. Unfortunately, we have, I am uh, out a couple of days, and then, uh, of course, Wednesday is the exam. Uh, but uh, we'll be there on Piazza, so if you have any questions, please post there. Try to make them uh, public posts so that everyone else can see them as well. All right, any questions before we start? So the final exam is on Wednesday at 8, 8 a.m. here in this class. It's a three-hour three exam, so it'll be longer than the midterm, but the same format, and it's uh, not comprehensive. So whatever we started looking at after the midterm will be covered in the exam. Go ahead. Next Wednesday, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay. So, so, if there are no questions, let's get started. So, I just wanted to wrap up our discussion on singular value decomposition, right? So, SVD is not like a core machine learning technique as such, right? But it's used, as we saw, to do PCA, which is a dimensionality reduction method, right? That's why we looked at it. But then we also saw how it is useful for. Uh, computing these low rank approximations of data, right? So it could be any data. We have been looking at images. So images have, uh, uh, you know, rows and columns. Same way uh, you could have a data matrix X, which has N rows and D columns, and you can do SVD on that. What that gives you is another matrix with same dimensionality. But uh, because of the SVD theorem, what it says is that the difference between this and the original matrix will be minimal uh, among all similar kinds of uh, low rank approximation, right? So that was the idea. And then we saw how to use it for certain things. But today, I, and then I kind of mentioned how it could be used for, uh, um, as a recommender system, right? So recommender systems are sort of this class of problems where you want to predict you want to recommend items to people. So places like Amazon and Netflix do that. So based on what your purchase history, they want to predict or they want to recommend more items. Maybe you want to buy this or that, right? So one way to do that, of course, is that uh, is sort of this, uh, what do you call that? Uh, collaborative filtering approach where you say, okay, I have bought these items, right? And there are these other people who have also bought those items. So they are similar to me. Now, they have also bought some extra items, so maybe I should like to buy those items as well. So that's one approach. But you can also do this, solve that problem. Uh, you can look at this problem as a matrix filling problem. So let's say you have a matrix like this, where you have as rows people and as columns some products. And there is a one if this person has bought this product, right? And now what you want to do is you, and then there is a there is a blank if that person has not bought that product, right? And oops, sorry. And what you want to do is fill these entries. So that's why we call it like a matrix filling problem because you want to say should Jim, would Jim be interested in buying a TV or not, right? So if I look at this data as a matrix, so here is the matrix that I want you to focus on. So this is a binary matrix with ones and zeros. I can do SVD on this, take a low rank approximation of that, and then reconstruct my matrix, right? And what you will see is that some of these zeros will become one. And then you can say, hey, let's predict this. So in fact, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this Netflix challenge. It was a sort of this uh, online challenge that was offered almost 10, 10 years ago now. Uh, so Netflix just gave out some of its data saying, here are all the people and these are the movies they've watched and then you had to sort of uh, recommend more movies, right? And there was a way to evaluate your algorithm. So, so the very first 
thing that people did was SVD and they did pretty well and then of course people did more and uh, eventually they won some money but SVD sort of is sort of the first thing you would do right so this is how we do it so we have the data remember this was my XV that matrix and I do SVD on it and if you remember that SVD gives you three things U uh, which is the left singular vector matrix S which is a call which is essentially a vector which forms your S matrix which has all, which has all the singular values in it and then V which is your right singular matrix right and the first thing you want to say is okay how many singular values I need to consider so for that we essentially plot all of our <coughs> singular values or square of singular values and that gives you what we call an elbow plot which is very similar to the scree plot for uh, PCA which essentially tells you okay if I use the first singular value how much error would I incur in the approximation right so of course if I don't use anything that I incur the full error but it seems like it turns out that if you just use the first singular value you it you do a pretty good job so if you keep increasing the singular values you of course will reach zero but it seem it turns out that at one uh, is good enough so what you could do now is you can truncate your SVD remember we also call it the truncated or thin SVD where we only consider the first few singular vectors so one way to do that is I just make the singular values zero because eventually you will be multiplying these things right so we multiply to get back the matrix we multiply u times s times v so if I make some of these entries zero these will not figure in the eventual computation so that's what I do I just make I just take the top two entries and then everything else zero and then I can compute my new uh, new s a uh, new x so this is the reconstructed s this is u tilde s tilde v tilde uh, and that gives you the new sort of filled out matrix so if you look at that <clears throat> so what you will see so this is a new matrix and what you will see is that some of the entries now are one which were not uh, one earlier so for example this one so and then you can say okay maybe we should predict this uh, recommend this item to this customer let me see one example for you this is a very small data set you might not see too drastic a change but uh, yeah uh, uh, sometimes it might also turn some one as zero because this is just a mathematical operation which kind of tells you that hey this person should not be buying this but you ignore that because that person already bought it right well anyway I'll leave it to you to oh maybe this one so for example this is a one that was not there before right which means that this person whoever this was could be recommended this particular item right so Karen could buy peanuts makes sense uh, right so that is the idea now you'll also see some other issues for example as we saw that some of the ones became zero which is something we don't like uh, you might also see now here of course I have truncated everything but sometimes you might even see negative values right which is something you don't like either right because what does it mean that somebody should be recommended a negative value so of course SVD does not control that in SVD you do not have any control on these values to be positive or negative it is just a, a optimization problem right however there are other methods to sort of handle that so something like a non -neg non negative matrix factorization is another method that we are not going to talk about at all but the only reason i'm mentioning it is that if you want to force your output to have only positive values because positive makes sense then you might want to explore nmf non negative ma matrix factorization which is also similar to svd it's, so it it also does some kind of a matrix factorization but you put extra constraints on that so you put a constraint that all the values should be positive and in some way we know how to do that because it's an optimization problem with some constraints so you can in principle solve them uh, using like a Lagrangian method or something similar all right so that is the idea so that is how we use SVD for uh, rec uh, as a recommender system right uh, what else uh, do I want to talk about SVD and then we also of course saw SVD as a way of approximating your data 
All right, any questions so far before we switch to another topic? All right, so now I just want to talk about one last topic in the whole course, which is called spectral clustering. So it's another clustering method. Uh, the reason I didn't talk about it when we did k-means was because it's, I mean, it's ob objective is still the same. You have data, you want to partition it into groups. But the way it does that is what we call a spectral method. And since we looked at spectral method so on, uh, for last week or so, I thought this would be a nice continuation to that. So what do we mean by spectral method is whenever you're doing any kind of eigenvalue decomposition, right? So then those methods are also referred to as spectral methods because you're looking at the eigenvalue spectrum of a matrix. So that's why, so even here we will see that uh, spectral methods are trying to do what we call, uh, sorry, spectral clustering also uses some form of eigenvalue decomposition to, to get your answer, all right? So, so, so think about it the, this way. Mm, so we have looked at three types of uh, machine learning, uh, I mean three ways of solving machine learning problems. One is error based methods like neural networks where you define an objective function and then you apply some kind of an optimization procedure to get your answer. Second is a probabilistic method where you are trying to maximize uh, some kind of a likelihood or a posterior to get your answer. And the third is where you pose your problem as an eigenvalue problem, right? So for example, we saw in PCA that we wanted to do this latent factor uh, embedding and we saw that if you want to find the, those principal component directions by maximizing the direction or maximizing the variance, right? That turned out to be similar to solving an eigenvalue problem, right? That's why it's a spectral method. So that's sort of think of it as a third way of doing machine learning. Now, not every problem can be posed as an eigenvalue problem, right? Uh, so that's why you don't see a spectral neural network, for instance. But in many cases, especially whenever we are talking about these uh, latent factor embedding where you have some latent factors and you have original data, so those things can be posed as an eigenvalue problem and then you can solve it using eigenvalue decomposition. So spectral clustering is another way, is another application of that. All right, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Yes, yes. So, right. So, so the question is that when you say this, you mean spectral methods. Yes. Uh, right. So, are spectral methods uh, their own um, machine learning prob uh, algorithms or are they sort of tools that would help you in coming up with machine learning uh, things, right? Uh, a solution. So, uh, the answer is you can use things like PCA, right, as a pre-processing step, of course. Uh, so you can, uh, so any dimensionality reduction method can be used as a pre-processing step. Uh, and then, then you can do more machine learning things on top of that. So that's, yeah, that's true. But sometimes you might just want to do that pre-processing itself, for example, in clustering, right? So you just want to find the clusters. So in that case, it is, uh, a machine learning task by its, by its own, right? But what spectral, cluster, spectral methods let you do is solve a machine learning problem using eigenvalue decomposition. So that's the way you want to look at it. So you could have the same problem. You could have a clustering problem, right? So the clustering problem is oblivious of what kind of optimization you do underneath. Now you can solve it using some kind of, a, you know, a probabilistic approach like mixture model. Right. You can solve it using by optimizing some kind of an error function like k-means does in a uh, iterative way or you can solve it using a spectral method like we will see today. So think of it as a, another sort of a tool in your toolbox to solve some of these machine learning problems. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. So spectral clustering, as I said, is another approach to do clustering, where the idea is that you can, <clears throat> you represent your data as a graph, all right? So we haven't talked about graphs at all uh, in this uh, course, but think of a data matrix in which you have n data points, right? And let's say all of these data points are in some d-dimensional space. 
you can construct a similarity matrix. So in this you can also relate to a kernel matrix, right? So where every entry, so it's an n cross n similarity matrix, every entry is essentially some kind of a similarity between a pair of points. So C, Sij is sim xi comma xj and sim is some similarity function and it could be anything that you want to use. It needs to be symmetric of course. Uh, so the idea is that you can construct a graph. So for example, you can take the cosine distance between two vectors or you can even take a negative of Euclidean distance that will become like a Euclidean similarity, right? So you can construct this matrix in many ways, but what spectral clustering methods do is they start from W, this matrix. Oh, sorry. All right, so there is one more step. So first you construct this S. Then what you do is you construct this uh, adjacency matrix. So I'm, I'm assuming you have done graph theory a little bit, right? So whenever you have a graph, you think uh, there is a adjacency matrix which denotes which nodes are connected to each other, right? So every graph has nodes and edges and then it has uh, and that adjacency matrix kind of encodes the edges. So which edge is connected or so which node is connected to which node. And these methods assume that this is an undirected graph, which means that, uh, you know, there is no direction in the edges, which means that your adjacency matrix is symmetric. And uh, it is also weighted, which means that it's not just 1 and 0. So it's not just that you are connected or not, but it's a weighted undirected graph, which means that you have some value to the edge, some weight associated with the edge. Now this graph essentially connects two edges if or connects two nodes if those two points are nearest neighbors of each other, right? So that is one way to construct this graph. So for example, what I could do is, I can construct, I, let's say this is my data, right? So x1, x2, I have x, uh, just four data points, right? So the first thing we do in spectral clustering is construct this S matrix, which will be four by four, right? And each entry will tell you the similarity. And let's say your similarity function gives a value between zero and one, right? So, and of course the similarity between, uh, with yourself is going to be highest, so that's one. And then everything else will be something. So let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and symmetric. So let's so say these are just some arbitrary values, right? So this is our S matrix. From this, what we do is for every data point, I find out what is who is my closest neighbor, right? And then I construct a new matrix, I call that W. And of course, everybody, uh, we, we are going to ignore any self loops. So in our adjacency matrix, nobody is connected to themselves. And so this point, the nearest neighbor for this is the point number two. So we'll connect that, all right? In fact, we'll connect it and we'll call its weight as the similarity and everything else will be zero. And here it will be 0.800. Point, oh sorry, 0 0.80 and 0 0.60. So this becomes my uh, graph, right? So if you could, if you think about it in a sort of a graph format, let's say this is my node one, node two, node three, and node four. One, two, three, four. Right. So one is connected to two. Uh, two is connected to three. Three is connected to two. Oh, that's true. Uh, that's it. And four is connected to two as well. So this is my graph, right? And these are the weights here. I we we make it symmetric as well. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right. So uh, so there are three edges three edges, right? Yeah. So this will be our graph, right? 
So what spectral clustering methods do is they take your data and they convert it into a graph and after that they will do some kind of a graph clustering. So if you had your data which is already a graph, right, then also spectral clustering methods could be used except that you will now start from this step rather than this step. You don't have to construct the graph because you already have the graph. Another interesting thing about this is that you could think of it as a kernel method as well because as long as you have some way of computing the similarity, you can construct this graph. So the, each of these axes need not be in some vector space. As long as there is a similarity metric defined for a pair of objects, you can construct this graph and that's where you start, with, all right? So that is the idea behind this. Now, how do we cluster it? So what spectral clustering methods do is they pose the problem as a problem of graph partitioning. So what is graph partitioning is that if you have some nodes, you want to group the, the, uh, the nodes into certain partitions such that nodes in a partition are connected to each other, but they are not connected to anything outside, right? So it kind of uh, looks like a spectral clustering. So for example, if I go here, so in our notebook for spectral clustering, So in, in this notebook, I use a very interesting uh, library called Network X. So Network X is sort of a graph analytics library in Python. So what that lets me do is, uh, first of all, it lets me create graphs. So let's say this is my graph, all right? So this is the adjacency matrix and this is the graph. So here I'm assuming I already have the graph, but of course, if you had data, then you would follow the procedure that I just explained to get to this graph. But let's say we have this graph and here we are assuming it's unweighted. So it's either one or zero, but that need not be case, right? So now what does spectral clustering do? Spectral clustering tries to group points, to, nodes together such that things in one node, in one partition are all connected. So for example, there was another example. So let's say this was my graph, no, not this one. Oh, yeah. Let's say this is my graph, right? It has uh, 12 nodes. So what we would like to do is we would like to create three partitions, one in which we have one through five, one in which we have 11 through 13, and one in which we have six through 10, right? Why? Because if I partition them like this, all the nodes here are connected to each other fairly heavily, and they are not highly connected to any other partition. Same thing with this one and same thing with this one. So that would be an ideal partitioning. Of course, you can partition it in an other way as well. I could put two and 10 and 11 together, but that's not a good partition because they are not connected to each other at all and they would be connected to other partitions too much. So in spectral clustering, we kind of mathematically formulate this idea, right? So this is the objective function for spectral clustering, also known as a graph min cut problem. So in algorithms, I'm assuming in your 250, uh, you might have seen this. So if you have a graph, a min cut, one min cut is the cut, is cut that you put on the edges such that things that are on the either side of this cut are not too connected with each other, right? So you want to find the minimum number of edges such that if you remove them, your graph will have two components. So similar idea here, you're trying to figure out how to partition my, so each A, K here is a set of node, right? And you're trying to figure out a cut like this, such that this is minimized. So what is this objective function? So for every partition, it's trying to essentially measure how many edges are there outside. So how many edges are there from nodes in AK to nodes outside AK? So you, and you're trying to, and of course there are weights with those edges, right? So you're trying to minimize that weight. So that's the, graph cut problem and because of the way we constructed this graph, what you can clearly see is that this will give you an obvious way of doing clustering, right? So that is the idea. Any questions so far? Yeah. Right, so the question is what if there are more than two partitions? This would still work because here actually this formulation is trying to find k cards. So if there are k card partitions, it will, if you are, able to minimize this, then you will, you will find all the k partitions. And in fact, what I'll show here is that this particular algorithm, 
will give you some more guidance as to how to choose this k. Remember, this k is always sort of this thorn in our side that how to choose this k, right? And this one kind of gives you a little bit more information than clustering does. All right, so everyone is clear with this about this objective function, right? So all you're doing is you're saying, if this is my partition, the way I score this partition is I take all the edges that are going from this partition, all the nodes within this partition to outside, and then I'm adding them up. And then I'm doing that for every partition and adding all of those up, and that becomes my score. And I want a partitioning, which would be essentially uh, clustering, which gives me the minimal score. All right. Now, one thing you might see is that let's say you only had two two nodes, right? So one way to optimize this would be that you put only one node in one partition and everything else in another partition, and that give, that would give you a small value, right? And but from the clustering perspective, that's not what you want. So what you want essentially is some more non-degenerate solution. So you formulate this normalized min cut problem where you also divide it by the size of your partition. So you also want large partitions. So you want large partitions as well as uh, no edges across partitions. So this, this is called a normalized min cut problem where you're trying to minimize sort of this, this fraction, some of this fraction. All right. So, uh, all right. So if you want to solve it, this is a class of uh, problems in computer science which we call NP hard, which means that it's not, uh, you cannot find a solution in polynomial time to this, right? You can, if you have a solution, you can check if it is true in polynomial time, right? But, uh, but you cannot find it in polynomial time, which means that these are not, you cannot come up with an eff efficient solution to solve this. But what we can do is we can solve sort of an approximate version of this where what we do is we say that le instead of finding sort of this partitioning, exact partitioning, if we just find some weights such that for every node, if we just find, okay, what is the sort of the score or probability? I don't want to say probability because it's not really guaranteed to be some of, guaranteed to sum up to one, but think of it as some kind of confidence. So it's, what it's saying is that instead of giving these kind of absolute values where we say, Cik is one if i belongs to cluster k, right? That becomes a hard problem to solve. That's that's an uh, you can uh, reduce it to zero one knapsack problem, which is known to be NP hard, right? But if instead of that we say everybody can belong to every uh, partition with some score, right? Then that could be solved. And in fact, what we can see is what we will see is that it becomes an eigenvector problem. So instead of uh, trying to solve it as an optimization problem, we can pose it as an eigenvector problem and then solve it, and that's why we call it spectral clustering. All right, so let's look at that. So to do that, we first introduce this new uh, concept of a graph Laplacian. Okay, so that's another French word after Lagrangian that we will see, called the Laplacian. What is a Laplacian or a graph Laplacian? So let's say you have some um, adjacency matrix, right, of a graph. W, right. So W is just an n cross n matrix, and it is going to be. Uh, for now, let's assume that these are all just zero or ones, but it could be anything. So these are, of course, these are all zeros, and then there is there are weights here for each edge, right. So that's your W. Let's say we construct this matrix D. D is a diagonal matrix, so it has zeros here and just values here, such that D i i is just summation W i j j equal to one through n. So all D does is it just sums up all of your values in a row and puts it in the diagonal. So that's the definition of D. All right. So you can think of each entry here is just telling you the degree of this node, right? So let's say if this was just all ones. So if you add these up, this will just tell you how many nodes was this node connected to, 
right? Even if these are uh, weights, then it tells you the weighted degree. So D captures the degree of your node, right? So what L is, the Laplacian L is basically D minus W. That's it, right? Very simple. So it's the difference between this diagonal matrix, which kind of tells you the degree of each node, and minus W, which is the original adjacency matrix. So there are some interesting properties of this L, right? So one thing you will see is that this L, all so for L, properties of this L, each row sums up to zero, right? That's easy to see, right? Because uh, when you sum any row, essentially this part will sum up to the sum of this row, which is in this, right? So when you just take the sum of the row, it will be zero. That's easy to understand, right? Any questions about that part? Okay. So each row sums up to zero. Then another thing is that if you do the eigen decomposition of this matrix, right, then you will see that L has one eigen va value equal to zero. Okay, and one eigenvector and the corresponding actually, this the corresponding eigenvector equal to all ones or a constant value throughout, right? So this is also easy to show because if you think about it, right, let's say So what does this mean that L has one eigenvalue corresponding zero? It means that if you take L, right, and multiply it by this vector one, right, this will be equal to zero times this vector one, right? So because an eigen eigen solution for any matrix essentially says that L u is equal to lambda u, right? That's the idea behind eigenvalue. Now you can see that this will be true. Why will this be true is because if you take L, right, so if you take any matrix and you multiply it by a vector of 1, right, so what will happen here is that this, so, so the answer for this will be you will first compute this times this, right, and these are all 1s, so all you are doing is essentially just computing the sum of this row, so this will be just a sum of row 1 sum of row 2, row n, right? And we know that, uh, since we saw earlier, each row sums up to 0 for uh, L, right? Which means that this will just be a vector of 0, which means this will be same as writing 0 times a vector of 1, right? Which means that, 1 and 0 are the eigenvector eigenvalue for, at least one eigenvector eigen, eigenvalue of this Laplacian will be 0 and 1. Okay, any questions so far? All right, good. So this is another property. Now one more property of this is that if your graph has k connected components, so I didn't talk about components, but if you have any graph, right, which looks like this, And let's say there are some edges. Then we say that this graph has three components, three connected components. Okay. If you have a graph which is like this, then we say this has one connected component because this is the basically how many you know groups can you make so that there are no edges across groups. So the so one property of uh, Laplacian is that if your graph or your W right the graph that is represented by your W matrix has k connected components, then you will have k eigenvectors which will have zero eigenvalue. Okay, and that is something that you can prove as well. I, I don't think I'll go into that, but uh, that's a similar discussion as 
just this one. So these are the five properties that I've listed here. Uh, first is each row sums to zero, that's clear. Second is one is an eigenvector with eigenvalue equal to zero. It's symmetric and positive semi-definite. That also you can show. So symmetric is easy to show because W was symmetric, right? So D minus W will also be symmetric. Uh, it is positive semi-definite. That is something that you can show because all these Ds will have only positive values because they are summing up some degree, right? Uh, and W is a symmetric matrix, right? So if you work it out, so if you take any vector x, multiply d minus w by x, you can show that for any x, this value will be at least greater than or equal to 0. So that's sort of uh, easy to show, but we'll not go into that today. Uh, but what this helps us do is that because it is symmetric and positive definite, so you can compute the eigenvalues for this, right? So it has n non-negative real valued eigenvalues. That's a prop. That's sort of a linear algebra sort of a uh, result that takes you from three to four. So if your matrix is no positive non semi-definite, then it will have n non-negative real valued eigenvalues. But the more interesting property that I want you to look at is this number five. Is that if your graph, the original graph that you started with to construct your Laplacian, has k connected components, right? Then your eigenvector, you will have k eigenvectors which have zero eigenvalues, right? And this is also easy to sh show in the same way as I showed for the, the first one, right? The point is that now you can use this to, to do clustering, right? So if your graph had these k connected components, which means that these are the k clusters, so what you can do is you can get your L, do the eigenvalue decomposition of that, and then look at the eigenvalues that are zero and they will correspond to the um, they will correspond to your disconnected components so let me show that to you in a more like an example and then we'll look at a little more uh, let's say right so let's say this is my eigen uh, this is my graph right which i constructed uh, using network x but we can also construct it using your data using the procedure I showed earlier. So this will be the Laplace. So this is my degree, that D, right? So all it's a diagonal matrix in which all the entries are essentially the sum of the row. And then this is my Laplacian, that's D minus W. And you can quickly verify that if I take a sum of this row, it will sum up to zero, that, that's easy to see. But now let's do the eigenvalue decomposition of this. So this is the eigenvalue decomposition. E are my eigen, <coughs> values. So what you will see is that there will be at least one value here which will be 0, which is here. It's close to 0, it's just in, because the way they compute these eigenvalues is through some numeric uh, iterative scheme. So this is one eigenvalue that is 0, which is the property of Laplacian. And then what you'll see is that there will be one eigenvector here, which will be all constant. It might not be all ones, but you know you can always take out the constant part and put it in zero. That doesn't matter. But you'll see at least one. So where is that? Oh, you can just look at this value, right? Which one is this? So zero, one, two, three, four. Than this one. It will be close to, I mean, uh, because it's a numeric sort of uh, approach, so you might not get exact ones, but if I plot this, the fourth eigenvector, right, so it's close to all zeros, or all constants. Right, which corresponds to this particular eigenvector. So this is all the eigenvector eigenvalues. So first eigenvalue through twelve, one of them will, will be zero because that's the property of a Laplacian, and then that will give you this. Right. So that is the first thing that I want to tell you. But now let's say if my graph has disconnected components like this, so there are two clear disconnected components. So now if I do my eigenvalue analysis on this and look at the eigenvalues, 
So what that property 5 tells me is that there will be two eigenvalues which will be 0, right? That's a property. And the interesting thing is that if we look at the eigenvectors corresponding to these 0 eigenvalues, this is what they look like. So what they look like is that they're not all 1s. What they have is they are 0 for some of the nodes. So each entry here on x-axis is a node, right? So this is the eigenvector. Some of them are 0, some of them are non-zero. So what you'll see is that they exactly correspond to your partition here. So this one is all sort of the second partition. This is the first partition. So that's what happened. And this one is that. So what you could do is, the reason I'm showing you this is that now if I, I had given you some data, right? Let's say the data was huge, you know, thousands of nodes. And I didn't know how many components there were, but let's say somebody told me that there are some disconnected components. We don't know how many, but we know that there are some, right? What we can do is we can quickly construct the Laplacian, which we know how to do, do the eigenvalue decomposition, and then quickly look at this eigenvalue, right? And see how many zero values do I see? Those will be the number of I components that there are. So if this graph had only one component, which means everything was connected, right, there was no isolated partitions, then you will only get one eigenvalue, which is zero, right? That's what uh, the first property tells you. But if you have a graph in which there are two, then you'll get two. If there are four, you'll get four. And then what you do is you take that eigenvalue and plot its corresponding eigenvector, right? And that will give you which points, which nodes are in this partition. So it's pretty neat, right? So this tells you that, okay, Nodes from 0 through 4 are in this one partition, and nodes from whatever 5 through 9 are in another one, right? So that's sort of a natural way of doing clustering, all right? Any questions so far? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. so, so W is the adjacency matrix. So it will have as many non-zeros, as many edges that are starting from that node, right? So, so for example, here, uh, where is my here? For this graph, this is my W adjacency matrix. So it will have as many once as so this is the first node so zero right so since zero is connected to four nine six seven eight so it will have one in all of those values all of those locations because w tells you the adjacency matrix who is connected to who Oh, I see, I see. So you are talking about when we were looking, starting from the data, right? Yeah. So if we were starting from the data and we were only looking at the first nearest neighbor, then you will have only one, yeah, one edge per point, right? Because everybody will just be connected to their nearest neighbor. But here I am showing you a general cl graph clustering method, right? And, uh, okay, so that's a good point. So, in fact, one thing I wanted to point out was that constructing this, uh, this graph you need not use just one nearest neighbor. In fact, people use more than one, typically k, so that they have a nicely connected graph. So then you will have exactly k ones in each row, right? Because everybody would be connected to their k nearest neighbor. Uh, if, if k is one, then you'll be connected to only one. So yeah, you're right. But in general, for spectral clustering, since we do not assume that we are always constructing our graph from data, maybe the graph is already given to us. Right? And we still want to do clustering. So in that case, you could have more than one once there. You have a follow-up there, or, right? I mean, what you will see is that in those special circumstances, you you might have some additional properties of your Laplacian, right? Because your Laplacian, as you said, will only have two entries that are non-zeros. And then you can think of other ways. But yeah, here I want you to think about a general case where you have a general graph and you just want to cluster. 
All right? Any other questions? So now the next question you should ask me, or at least be thinking about, is that what if there are not truly disconnected components, but nearly disconnected, right? Uh, because, so let's say, what if my graph looks like this, which clearly there are no clear partitions here. So how do I still find these, right? And it turns out that the same approach would still work here. The idea would be that now you will not have three zero eigenvalues, right? You will, in fact, you will only have one zero eigenvalue because there's only one component, but you will have three eigenvalues which have very small values. So you can show from, um, these are results that will come from things like matrix perturbation theory, where you can show that there will be at least three eigenvalues that will be very small. So they will not be zero, but will be very small, and they will allow you to do the clustering now. So for example, in this graph, right, let's look at this. So this is my W, construct my D, and do my eigenvalue analysis. Right, and now if I look at my eigenvalues, what I'll see is, so which one is my eigenvalue? The first one you will see that there are some eigenvalues which are small and these will tell me which uh, eigen uh, which are my components of course there will always be one eigenvector which will be all constant right because there's one component but you can look at the other ones to find out the clustering so now what you can do is you can say okay this eigenvector let me look at the values which are high and these are the points that belong to this cluster same way here here so this will let you do the clustering so in fact, what you could do is, so instead of doing that, right, because it's not very easy to sort of look at these points, right, and say which are high, right. So what typically people do in spectral clustering is they look at these values, right, and then they construct a new data matrix in which you have every point and you have the eigenvalue for every point for the top or the lowest eigenvectors, right. So you look at, okay, these are my small eigenvalues. Let me take the corresponding eigenvectors and take their value. So there are new features for you. And then you can do clustering on that. So let's say k-means, right? And if you do clustering, this is what it gives you. These are my points in one component. These are points in another component. And then these are last points, right? So that is the way you use spectral clustering in cases where you do not have clearly split uh, partitions. So as I said here, right, so in practice, W might not have K exactly isolated connected components, but what you can do is you can look at the small values of your eigenvectors or the small eigenvalues of the eigen decomposition of L and use that and take their eigenvectors and that gives you like a new data, right? So let's say you saw that there are three very small eigenvalues. I'll take the, those three eigenvectors and that will give me a N cross three data set. Right, and then if you do k-means clustering on that, that will give you a good result. All right, so I might take a few minutes in next class to illustrate this, but just quickly let me show that to you. So let's say this was my data. Right, so this data has two com two circles here. So there are two clusters that are natural. First, we run k-means on this, and we clearly see that k-means does not work very well. K-means will just try to partition them into two circles essentially, right? So uh, this is what you get. But if you do spectral clustering on this, so in spectral clustering, what we do is we find first the nearest neighbors converted into our graph, right? And then do the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian and go on with that. So if you do that, this is what you get, right? Beautiful result because uh, it is looking at, so essentially what happens inside is that for every point, right? We looked at who are its nearest neighbors. I think here we use five nearest neighbors. So then that way we construct the graph. So if you think about it, what will happen is that for every node, it will only be connected to other nodes which are in this circle, right? It won't be likely that any node is connected to somewhere far, maybe for this one. So, and then when we look at that graph, actually that graph will have two beautifully disconnected, isolated connected components. 
and then you can do spectral clustering on that and get the result. All right, so that is the idea. I'll encourage you to just take a look at this page, not for the course, but just for future, where we have compared many clustering algorithms on many different data sets, right? So I have talked about k-means and I have talked about spectral clustering. There are, of course, many more. And what you will see from this simple experiment is that for different types of data, these different algorithms have, you know, they behave differently, all right? Any other questions before we stop? Okay, so I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you very much.